Welcome to Let's Learn Algorithms. In this video, we're going to talk about queues, and then in the next video, we're going to talk about stacks, which are similar to queues, but you know, there are some subtle differences between the two that will sort of change how you use them and you know, when you use them. So to get started, we're just going to sort of cover what a queue is. And to do this, I'm going to try to use real world examples because I feel like they're a lot easier to understand if you just think of them like the, you know, the real world representation of what they're meant to cover. So I'm going to leave full screen here. I just want to, you know, actually be able to move these things around and show you. A queue is like a line at the DMV or a line at the grocery store or really any sort of line that you can think of where people enter the back of the line and, you know, they move towards the front. So whenever people enter, you know, if you're the first person to enter the line, you move to the front of the line. If you're the second person, you're the second person in line. Third person's third in line and, you know, continues on like that. So the way a queue works from there is that whenever you know somebody's ready to process something from the queue uh, so for example in the dmv you might have the receptionist and he or she might be ready to call the next person when they do that they call the next person from the front of the line so this yellow person here would move out of the line and they would go up to whoever you know whoever's ready for the next person so now this purple person is the next person in line and then we've got the red person and you know we might have more people come into the line and they'll always join at the back of the line so whenever a you know an item gets put into a queue, it always waits until everything before it has been processed before it actually gets processed. So you know we're always pulling from the front and putting things into the back. So now that I've sort of covered what what a queue is, I want to just talk about two common terms you're going to see, and they're not confusing or anything, but I just want you to understand what they are so that if you hear me say them or somebody else say them, you know what they mean. The first is to enqueue something, which means to add an item to the back of the queue. So that's like if we took this blue person and added it to the back of the queue. Dequeuing is removing an item from the front of the queue. So that's when we take this first person in the queue and we pull them out. That's where dequeuing that person. So now that you have a rough idea of what a queue is, we're going to look at how to implement a queue and go. So there are a lot of ways to implement a queue, and I'm just going to go back to full screen for the time being. There are a lot of different ways to implement a queue, and you can use all sorts of different data structures to represent the items in your queue. So I don't want you to really get caught up on this. I'm just sort of letting you know that you can use like linked lists, slices, a fixed size array, or if you're in another language like Java, you might use an array list and you know, sort of build on top of that. It really depends on what makes the most sense for you. And you can also do optional things like setting a maximum capacity. You might have a queue that says we can have at most five people in this queue right now, or five items, whatever they happen to be. So all of those are optional things that you can do. We won't be really covering you know, capacity and that sort of stuff because truthfully, it's, it's relatively specific needs whenever you have to do stuff like that. So the more general use case is just a queue that you know, allows for any number of items, and we can use something like a slice to store it. So as I said, we're going to use a slice, and that's mostly just to keep things simple. Slices are easy to work with because you know they can dynamically change in size, and you might you know, you might come back and say like, oh, using that slice means it's going to have to resize more often, and it's going to be a little bit slower. So I just want to warn you now that you really shouldn't get caught up in those minor details right now. For the most part, you just want to understand how it works, and then when you do get to a point, if you find out that your queue implementation is really slowing things down, you can tweak it. But, you know, whenever you're just getting started, these are such minor details and minor speed improvements that they're not, worry, you know, they're not worth focusing on. The last thing is we're going to sort integer in our, integers in our queue for now. Um, you can replace with a, this with other data types, and you can use things like interfaces to, you know, kind of make it more generic. But because Go does not have generics, you can't write one queue implementation in Go that works for every data type, at least not as well as it would with generics. So the last thing that I want to sort of cover is just a rough overview of how we're going to do this implementation. So before we even jump into the code, I want to say that our slice, the length of our slice, will always have a length equal to the size of our queue. So if our queue has zero items in it, our slice is going to have a length of zero. If our queue has four items in it, our slice is going to have a length of four. Now the capacity of our slice, you know, the total number of memory allocated spots for it, is, is going to be something that might change. 
but the length of the slice, the actual used slots, will always be exactly the same as the number of items in our queue. And then the next thing is that our indices are going to go from the front of the queue to the back of the queue, meaning that the index 0 is going to represent the front of our queue, and the index 3 or 4 or whatever the highest index is is going to represent the back of the queue. So below I have two visualizations, and they're the same example. The only thing I'm sort of showing you here is that it doesn't matter if you, you put the front and the back on the left or the right, the indices always map so that 0 is at the front, and you know whatever the highest number is is at the back. So I should have covered this earlier. Uh, the one thing that I do want to say is that we won't be going over a ton of the uses for a queue right now, but the most common one is a BFS. And if you want to see that you know, in action, I do have another video where we're you know, sort of covering graph theory and some of the graph algorithms. So I should have one covering BFS shortly, but I had to make this first because I wanted to explain what a queue was before I actually went to those videos. All right, so now we're going to move on to coding. So I'm going to go here to my code, um, and I've got q.go is you know, just a file that I created. You can see that, well, let me get this up. So you can see q.go is, you know, it's, it, all it says is package main right now. It doesn't have anything else in it, and it's just here so that we can create our queue. So to get started, the first thing we're going to do is we want to create some sort of type that's going to, you know, contain our queue. So I've already said before that we're going to be using a slice to store the, you know, the values in our queue, and we're going to be storing integers in this queue just to make it simple. So to get started, let's just go ahead and start off with that type. We'll call it a queue, and its underlying type will be a struct, and then inside of that struct there'll be a slice of integers. So that slice of integers is going to you know, be what stores our actual items inside the queue. Now, with different implementations, people might keep track of things such as, you know, which index is the front of the queue, which index is the back of the queue, and things like that. But because slices can be resized dynamically, we actually don't need to keep track of that. We can just assume that index 0 is the front of the queue, and we can assume that, you know, whatever the last spot in the slice is, is the back of the queue. So the next thing we need to do is we need to write functions that help us NQ and DQ items. So we're going to need func. Uh, we'll go nq first, and this will take in an integer, and it will just add it to the queue. Add i to the queue. So we'll just go ahead and write a comment up here. nq adds the integer provided to the back of the queue. And we'll make this a to-do. And then we're going to need to also write a dq function. And this is not going to take any arguments, but it's just going to return an integer, which is the front. So we're going to say dq returns the first item in the queue, or panics if there isn't one. So this last bit, the panicking part, um, I'm not going to put any error checks in this, so if you try to DQ from a queue that doesn't have any more items, you're going to get an index out of bounds error, and it's going to panic and your program will crash. So one way to fix that would be to change this return type from int to int comma error, and to return an error when that happens, but we won't be doing that now because I just want to sort of explain how this works so you can see it, and then you can sort of add that stuff as you go. To do, return the first item in the queue. I need to change this definition. So it returns the first item in the queue and removes that item from the queue. All right, so return the first item from the queue, and then we need another to do, remove the first item from the queue. So this DQ is going to have to do two different things, return the first item and remove it. So you could technically consider that the same thing, but you know it's nice to sort of separate them into two little tasks that we're going to have to accomplish. All right, so we don't have a return statement here, so let's uh, we'll, we'll come back to that. For now, we're just going to put return zero just so we get rid of the error. Now we're going to go up to the nq function, and this is the first one we're going to cover. So whenever we want to add a new item to our queue, we know we want to add it to the back of the queue. The upside to this is that 
q.slice allows us to access the slice that we're using. And one thing that's really nice about this is that when you call append with a slice as the first argument and a value as the second argument, it always adds that value to the end of the queue, or to the end of the slice, sorry. Um, so in this case, we can actually use q.slice equals append q.slice comma i, and this will add the new item to the back of our slice, which is also the back of our queue. So that's all we actually have to write, you know, to add this new item to our slice. So that makes things really easy. And it also means that when we're adding items to this slice, that we aren't going to have to rearrange everything inside of our slice, and we don't run into this order n complexity whenever we're adding new items. The next thing we want to do is DQ, which is two steps. First, we need to return the first item in the queue. So let's just handle that first. So we'll say var ret int. So ret is going to be the value we're returning, and we're going to say it equals queue.slice, and we want whatever's at index zero, because the front of our slice is the front of our queue. So that's all we need to do. And technically, you could do ret colon equals, and that would do the same thing. So we've got this, and now we just need to make sure that we return ret at the end of our code. So we've, we've got this to do done. We are getting the first item in our slice, and then we're returning it. So I do want to also mention that I'm getting the value up here before I remove the item, because it's a lot easier to get the value out of the slice before it's removed from the slice, and then we return it at the very end. So the next thing we need to do is we need to remove the first item from the queue. So we need to do q.slice equals, now we want the slice from index one to however long it was. <clears throat> so to do that, you do q.slice, one colon len of q.slice minus one. Actually, I'm take that back. I don't know if you want length of the slice or length minus one, but we'll just test it this way, then we can move from there. Pretty sure we want this. All right, so now we just need to test this. There are different ways to test it. We could write a test. We could write a main function, um, you know, whatever sort of makes the most sense to you. I'm going to just use a main function for now because we are inside of you know a main package and it's just easier to just sort of let you see all the code right now. So I'm going to say var q q equals new q. And we're going to do q.nq. Uh, we'll add one, two, three. And then we'll, sorry, we'll dq it. And we'll also print out the queue. So we're going to nq an item, print out the queue, and then print out whatever the value we get back from dqing is. So let's just run that first and see what happens. All right, so you can see here that it looks like it's working correctly. When we print out the queue, we're getting this line here, and that looks a little bit weird. Uh, the reason you're getting that is because we've got a struct, a pointer to a struct, and then inside of that is a slice. So one way to sort of clean that up is to write a string function. So we'll do format.s print, and we'll do q.slice. So we're just basically telling it to use, you know, whatever you'd normally print out for a slice. That's what we're going to go ahead and print out for this entire queue structure. So it'll just make things a little bit nice when we run our code. And you can see here that this looks like an array now or a slice. And, you know, we've got the one, two, three is the value that's being dequeued. So let's just go ahead and add a couple in queues. We'll add 43 and we'll add 99. So. Now we want to just go ahead and DQ a couple items, and maybe we'll, you know, NQ another one in the middle of here just to sort of see how that works. All right, and then we'll go ahead and run this. So we've got 123, 43, 99. So we NQ'd 123, we NQ'd 43, and we NQ'd 99. So that order looks to be correct. The left-hand side is the front of our queue in this, you know, in this output. And then when we DQ, we get the front item. That's the 1, 2, 3. So that's the second line here on 34. So that's correct. And then we print out the entire queue. We've got 43.99 left, and that looks like it's correct. So it looks like our DQ function was actually correct. We wanted the length of the slice here. Um, you can see what happens if we were to change this. 
um, you can see here that it's pulling two, you know, we're losing that last item in the slice whenever we do minus one. So that wasn't actually correct. And it also eventually leads to a runtime error. So we definitely don't want the minus one there. We want the slice from one to whatever the length of the queue is. So going back to running this, um, you, you can see here we've got 43.99, then we DQ 43, then we NQ 101, and then we print out the queue. That's why you're seeing the 101 suddenly. And then we DQ the 99. So there's still a 101 left in that queue because we never DQ'd it, but then our program exits. All right, so that's everything we needed for Q. Um, you know, I don't want to go into too much other details about it, but that should give you a, you know, a rough idea of how Q works and how to code it. The last thing I'm going to talk about is something that I don't want to go into too much detail, but if you've ever heard somebody talk about generics and how Go doesn't have them, what they're referring to is structures like a Q. In other languages like Java, there'd be a way to do something like a T here. And then you can use a T here. So this looks really weird at first. So I'm just going to go ahead and explain that whenever this happens, um, usually what's happening is you're saying that you want like a Q equals new Q, and then you might say int, or even if you did integer or something like that. So what you're saying is that you can dynamically define this data type for the nested type. So this T type is dynamic. And that's, you know, that's usually where generics come into play is they're really nice for writing a Q structure once and then being able to use it with any single data type. So this is not valid Go code. So I'm just gonna go ahead and put this, not valid Go code. Um, but basically I wanted to show you this because this is one of those cases where it would be nice to have generics like this, and I'm not advocating for them in Go, I get why they're not there. But whenever people talk about it, it's because they don't wanna to have to rewrite this Q implementation for every different data type. But since Go does not have generics, instead what we need to do is write a queue for different types of data. And you know, so this one right here only works for integers. And then you might write another one for another data type. Or the other thing you could do is make this an interface, a slice of interfaces. And then for all of these values, we could just say interface. And you know, down here, this is going to return an interface. So the downside of this is that we then have to, you know, turn our values back into the right type. And, you know, we have to do a little bit of type checking and stuff like that, which is kind of annoying. So that's why, you know, people generally like the type safe version. So enough of the downsides of, of, you know, go and how generics would be helpful. I don't want to sort of bog you down with that. I just wanted to sort of mention it because it's something that I do think will come up here when people are asking, you know, do I have to write this for every single time, you know, for every single data type that I want to use? And the short answer is, I would suggest just going ahead and writing this. It's not a lot of code. It's only like 20 lines of code. And you could easily, you know, put these into packages. So you could have a queue package. So let's say we made this the queue package, and then we could name this the int struct. So whenever you want to use it, uh, let me go ahead and grab all of these. So whenever you want to use this, the way you would normally use it, in this package, we don't have to do it because we're inside of the same package. But let's say we we're inside of a different package, you might do something like q.int. And you know that that's what you're making is, this is your new type. So while it seems weird to call it int, calling it q.int makes it a little bit more clear that you know it's from the q package. So the int type from the q package is probably an integer q. So that's why you'll sometimes see data types named things like this. It's because whenever you stick them inside of a package like Q, it becomes pretty clear in the context what it's for. If you enjoyed this video and you want to check out some of my other work, you can find pretty much everything that I work on at www.calhoun.io. And if you join my mailing list, I will send you an email probably about once a week that just sort of lets you know what new stuff I'm publishing. And you know, you can just keep in touch with new content that I'm creating. I also have a course that teaches web development with Go. You can find that at www.usegolang.com. So if you could check those two out, I'd really appreciate it.